Buonasera a tutti e benvenuti all'Italian Academy. Good evening and welcome to the Italian Academy. I am Barbara Faed, Associate Director, and I am delighted to welcome you all to our fourth symposium on the Day of Remembrance. Last year, Professor Stowe gave a lecture on the ghetto in Rome and its vibrant subculture. This year, we will explore what happened to Jews and other minority groups, such as Roma and Sinti, during the Holocaust, and how racism and xenophobia toward them continue in the present day. Anti-Romani stereotypes are widespread in Europe. Underpinning governmental approaches to the Roma is the false conviction that all Roma are nomads. Indeed, in recent decades, 10 out of the 20 regions in Italy adopted the laws aimed at the protection of nomadic cultures through the construction of segregated camps. Those laws rendered official the perception that all Roma and Sinti are nomads and can only survive in camps, isolated from Italian society. The description of Roma as nomads is used not only in the service of segregating them, but also in order to reinforce the popular idea that Roma are not citizens and do not belong in a country. The use of camps is a key factor in perpetuating their status as outsiders or others. They are politically weak. They do not exist as persone but only as stereotypes. For more on this, our speakers today are Krista Eckberg and Robert Cushion. Krista Eckberg is a program officer at the Center for Advanced uh, Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She is currently finishing her PhD in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University with a dissertation on Aftermath, Accounting for the Holocaust in the Czech Republic, 1945-2005. Ms. Hepberg taught in the Department of Anthropology at Rutgers and uh, at the University of Lower Silesia in Poland, where she was a co-founder of the International Institute for the Study of Culture and Education. She is also a co-organizer of the Every Everyday Life in the Camps project an international interdisciplinary research project that assembles junior and senior Holocaust scholars from several disciplines to analyze the experience in the camps through the lens of everyday history and ethnography. Robert Cushion is the executive director of the European Roma Rights Center, an international NGO using legal advocacy, including strategic litigation, to protect the rights of Roma throughout Europe. He has been active in the human rights field in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union for over 20 years, beginning in 1988 when he helped the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights establish its first program in the Soviet Union. And as a Shell Fellow at Human Rights Watch in 1990-1991, where he led the research and reporting on the human rights abuses in the Soviet Union. From 1996-1999 and 2003-2007, he served in a number of positions at the Open Society Institute, including Director of International Operations from 2004-2007. At the Open Society Institute, he was responsible for a number of human rights programming areas, including initiatives focusing on Roma rights and disability rights. From 1999 to 2002, he was the executive director of Doctors of the World. In 2007-08, he served as the executive director of the Harvard PEPFAR program, a program that provides HIV treatment services to patients in Africa. From 1991 to 1996, he served in the office of the legal advisor, advisor of the U.S. Department of State, where he worked as counsel to the Bureau on Counterterrorism, liaison to the International Criminal Tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and negotiated a number of international agreements in the areas of scientific and environmental cooperation. 
He holds a JD from Columbia University, a BA from Harvard College in Russian Studies, and is the author of a number of publications in the area of human rights and no profit law. He is a member of the New York Bar Association and the Council on Foreign Relations. He serves on the boards of several NGOs dealing with human rights, health and development issues. After the, the talk, we would like to dedicate the final part of this event to a question and answer session. At the very end, we can continue the discussion with a drink on the first floor. Now, please welcome Ms. Krista Eckberg. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for coming, especially in this weather. Uh, and thank you very much, particularly to Barbara Faeda and the Italian Academy for inviting me to come talk to you this evening. How's the sound? Can you hear me in the back? Yes. A, li a little louder, or I should... I'll try for a little louder. In 1950... Louder? Okay. In 1950, the Polish linguist and ethnographer Jerzy Fitzowski, non-Romani linguist and ethnographer, I should say, published some observations from a study he had been conducting among Polish Roma who survived what we have come to call the Holocaust. With the exception of two songs from Auschwitz, sung very rarely, Fitzowski wrote in the Journal of the Gypsy Lore Society, I have not noticed any trace of the war years in the present life of the Polish gypsies. This he finds puzzling, given the magnitude of the catastrophe, which he described as six years of dreadful annihilation of living in a state of continuous horror. Fitzowski opened his article with a graphic description of this horror. He points out that Polish Roma were rounded up and ghettoized in the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, that many died in Germany in the concentration camps of Mauthausen, Ravensbrück, and Buchenwald, that many more were killed in the extermination camps that the Nazis established and occupied Poland, Auschwitz, Kalmno, and Treblinka, and that it would be an error not to take note that gypsies were routinely killed in massacres in the forest, hunted down and shot by German troops and their local collaborators. He cites numbers of Romani victims, and unlike many numbers of victims put forth for various groups in this period, Fitzowski's are relatively accurate. He tells a story, in fact, that unfolded across occupied Europe in the regions where the German authorities, particularly the SS, had free reign to undertake the final solution in Belarus and Ukraine, the Baltics, the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and Serbia, places where the losses in Romani populations ranged from between 50% into the 90s. Given all this, Fitzowski was puzzled. He goes on in the article to say, Polish gypsies rarely mention their martyrdom and do not like to dwell on that subject. Their cheerfulness has not abated. They seem to have completely dismissed from their minds the period of the war years. Their way of life has not changed at all. The ovens of extermination camps have been forgotten. Their fertility is very great. And the natural increase of population very high. The vitality of the gypsies has conquered death. Gypsies, of course, here are figured as the quintessential people without history, the people who forget historical consciousness displaced by their immediacy, their admirable vitality. And this is not an uncommon theme in popular accounts of the Romani Holocaust, even today, or possibly actually, especially today. Because strangely, although a historiography of this event spans at least 30 years, if we leave Fitzowski to one side, and Roma and Sinti and others persecuted as gypsies, as under the label of gypsy, that is, uh, have made claims for reparations, they've made claims for acknowledgement and for memorials, it would be fair to say that the Romani Holocaust has become known as unknown which is a little peculiar if you think about it. By way of example, uh, I just want to pull out one thread that leads back to Fitzowski's text. In an ethnographic portrait of contemporary European Romani communities, for example, Isabel Fonseca draws on Fitzowski's work to argue that Roma possess an instinct to suppress the past. The gypsies, she writes, and this is a book called Bury Me Standing, the gypsies with their peculiar mixture of fatalism and the spirit or wit to seize the day have made an art of forgetting the Holocaust. Others have picked up on this thread. Roma, writes Inga Klendenen, citing Fonseca, have chosen not to bother with history at all because to forget with a kind of defiant insouciance is the gypsy way of enduring. By the time we've gotten to this point, Fitzowski's basically perceptual problem, I have not noticed any trace of the war years in the present life of the Polish gypsies, has been displaced onto Roma themselves. 
Pitsovsky's, uh, excuse me, Fonseca's blunt conclusion is, it is a story that remains unknown even to many gypsies who survived it. So we know that the Romani Holocaust is unknown, it would seem because Roma obdurately didn't notice it when it was happening to them, and if they did, they in turn stubbornly chose to forget it. Fitzowski, however, is a little equivocal on this point. A few pages later in the same article, pages he devotes incidentally to efforts by a Polish Romani political leader to conduct a nationwide census of surviving Roma, Fitzowski describes an encounter with a Romani acquaintance in Warsaw. He tells her that he is planning on writing a book about what he calls the martyrdom of the gypsies during the 1939 to 45 years. <coughs> And the woman he's talking to grows apprehensive, asking warily why he would write about the dead in the paper. This he attributes to, and here again I'm quoting, an excessive suspiciousness and distrust of the Polish gypsies in relation to non-gypsies, which has increased after the last war as a result of their experiences. Recall what he said, dreadful annihilation, continuous horror. It is unclear, that is, whether Fitzowski's story is a recording of a Romany will to forget, which is what people read out of it, or if it's more a document of an ethnographic resistance he encountered among Roma in the wake of their genocide. This reflexive moment in Fitzowski's account, in which his status as interpreter is thrown into doubt, which actually he throws it into doubt, uh, this should give us some pause. The epistemological lacuna that frames the Romani Holocaust in so many accounts, that it is known as unknown, is an index, I would argue, not of the unknownness of the event, but of its eclipse. The elision, that is, of Romani experience under the sign of gypsy forgetting. After all, you would hardly tell someone not to write about something you didn't know had happened. There are some pretty basic mechanisms through which this elision happens, and we can see them at work in Fitzowski's account, at least some of them. The displacement onto Roma of the ignorance of the observer. The romanticization of gypsy presentness in the world, for example, their vitality, entwined with a lack of temporality. Elena Lemon, an anthropologist who has written about Romani theater in Russia, points out that the notion that Roma have forgotten their persecution in the Holocaust ignores the fact that most European Roma have not had access to the means through which collective memory is produced, particularly in the media. Note that it is Fitzowski who is writing a book, Fitzowski who is writing in the papers, and in fact it would not be uncommon for that time if we were the only person in the exchange with access to literacy itself. Moreover, most Romani survivors lived the rest of their lives in Eastern European countries where racialized persecution in the Holocaust was subsumed into the wider rhetoric of the anti-fascist struggle. The issue, Lemon writes, is not that Romans deny history, but that no infrastructure magnifies their memories as broadly collective, as constituting an imagined community. Instead, the notion of Romani forgetting is understood in the broader frame of an intrinsic lack of historical consciousness antithetical to Romani culture. This in turn has other effects, uh, one of which is to stage the issue of the Holocaust of Roma as one of other victims or understudied victims. And of course here in this category, Roma are not alone. Their persecution is read as ancillary to that of Jews. For example, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 explicitly racialize Jewishness, uh, but are then in turn applied to Roma, although they do not explicitly mention them in the law's original incarnation. Ah, sorry. So, though they die, and they die in large numbers, one of the animating questions of the study of Roma and the Holocaust is whether Nazis intended to annihilate the gypsies as a race. And in response, then, there's a sort of salvage historiography that in the face of attempts to argue that the Third Reich did not intend to annihilate Roma as such, and in the face of Roma who forget, restores their persecution and appends it to our established histories of the Holocaust, petitioning for a place there for Roma. Which is to say that the structure of known as unknown operates on many levels, that there is a paradoxical inclusion by exclusion, exclusive inclusion, to quote Giorgio Agamben, who of course is but one theorist of the, the outside on the inside. And this is very clearly at work in our understanding of what happened to Roma and Sinti in the in Italy, excuse me, sorry, in Italy in the fascist period. The short version of the story is that in 1940, Italy under Benito Mussolini put into effect racial laws targeting Jews, parallel to the race laws in Germany. 
Italy enters into the war that summer and not long after, a memo circulates that orders the internment of nomadic gypsies. A number of these were then transported to Sardinia, though some Roma seem to have been deported to the island uh, as early as 1938. Uh, initially, most were left to fend for themselves, but internment camps were set up in several places for this group of deportees. Also, some Roma fled to Italy from Yugoslavia, where the fascist independent state of Croatia uh, and the Ostasha were targeting gypsies. They too were deported to Sardinia and elsewhere in southern Italy, uh, including to camps set up for foreign Jews. When Italy capitulated to Allied invasion in 1943, the Italian police were ordered to deport gypsies from internment camps to Germany, which seems not to have happened. In part of northern Italy that came under direct German military control, gypsies were rounded up for forced labor or deported to extermination camps. Some scholars of the period have asked, is this evidence of a systematized anti-gypsy policy of racial persecution, or were Roma persecuted on the presumption of gypsy criminality? And what I would like to suggest in closing is that perhaps these are not the best questions to ask. In a recent study on the origins of gypsy policy in Italy, Jennifer Aluzzi points out that the exclusion of Roma and Sinti from the national community dates more properly to the origins of the modern Italian nation state. Aluzzi notes that in response to the crisis of thresholds and boundaries, the specter of nomadic gypsies precipitates. Executive authorities faced a decision. They could either include gypsies in the national project and discipline them within the juridical order, or exempt them entirely from it and also from the legal protections it entailed leaving the containment of the threat gypsies posed to an ever multiplying and intensifying set of policing measures that criminalized them, often on the local level. Thus, Aluzzi writes, from the founding of Italy as a nation state in the late 19th century, gypsies were always already excluded, at the same time as they were inextricably tied to that very nation state through a web of administrative regulations. Taking this exclusive inclusion as the basis for the questions we ask about the Romani Holocaust, allows us, actually I wrote allows and then I crossed it out and wrote impels us, impels us to reframe the story of what happened, juridical expulsion from the national community in the fascist period, for example, is not so important uh, if you are already not there. Uh, and the questions about the recognition of gypsies uh, can be relocated, excuse me, the racialization of gypsies can be relocated to that space where Roma found themselves uh, outside of that national community, outside of those juridical protections. Uh, moreover, it also doesn't require that we ask Roma to present themselves as victims in a national collectivity, uh, which is the thing that people like Fitzowski want out of Romani accounts. Uh, moreover, it also allows us to ask questions about the present in which the persecution of Roma does not rest on very different foundations. Consider the state of emergency around Romani camps in parts of Italy in 2008 that placed their Romani inhabitants outside the bounds of the juridical order. We don't have to look very far, that is, to see that Roma across the European continent still live in a dangerous space of their elision. Thank you. Uh, thank you as well, Barbara, for convening uh, this uh, little discussion. Um, I guess my job is to catch everybody up from the post-war uh, period to the present, which I'll try to do uh, fairly quickly and leave some time for, for questions. Um, the fate of, of, of Roma under communism was never uh, very rosy, but in retrospect, it's beginning to look better and better. Um, and I'm speaking obviously in generalities and, and there were a lot of distinctions uh, throughout Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, but the generalizations I think, think more or less hold true. Um, that uh, in the communist bloc there was created this sort of uh, very restricted spaces in which uh, people were permitted to express uh, ethnic identity, and in some cases, by law, ethnic identity uh, was sometimes uh, uh, required. So if you were Roma uh, or Gypsy, it was frequently stamped in your passport. Um, but at the same time, uh, it was a very limited form of expression that was simple, uh, frequently not available to Roma, uh, because they were not defined as a national minority in many countries, uh, and therefore um, uh, certain rights to 
education in, in their own language and to, and to cultural expression were not recognized. Now again, the situation varied um, from, from country to country, um, and Roma were frequently not even designated on census forms, so uh, countries uh, had, had no idea then, and actually today still have no idea exactly how many Roma are within their borders. Um, what communism did do was impose a sort of veneer of interethnic harmony uh, as, as part of ideology and, and uh, through the coercive uh, power of the state suppressed uh, overt expressions of, of racial hatred. Um, it also created a, um, uh, an economic system that provided at least a marginal standard of living uh, to Roma frequently in um, semi-skilled and unskilled jobs. Um, uh, as well, uh, the policies of, of forced settlement which were carried on in some countries uh, uh, before uh, the communist era were, uh, uh, were completed uh, under communism. So for example, in the Czech Republic in 1958, you have law uh, outlawing the nomadic lifestyle, and in Poland, 1964, you have a similar law that was passed. Um, and as Barbara noted at the very beginning, uh, in her introduction, that the uh, by and large in Europe today, Roma are not nomadic, uh, and I think it's important to keep that in mind, despite the uh, efforts of the Italian government to label them as nomadic under law, uh, and despite um, uh, the pronouncements of some others, uh, uh, Roma are not nomadic uh, uh, today, and there are some groups in um, France, UK, Belgium uh, that do um, have a nomadic lifestyle, but by and large Roma are sedentary, they move because of the reasons that everyone moves for uh, 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 in search of a better life, uh, um, fleeing structural poverty and, and systemic discrimination. Um, there were other uh, features of life under communism which um, um, were quite harmful to Roma, including policy in, uh, in Czechoslovakia to encourage and coerce the sterilization of Romani women. Uh, which is a, a policy and unfortunately a practice which lingers to this day. Um, and it was a practice which we saw in other countries, uh, in, in Hungary, for example, as well. Um, and in certain countries like Bulgaria, uh, you had a practice of really forced assimilation, not just of Roma, but of other minorities, particularly the Turkish minority uh, in Bulgaria, where people were uh, basically compelled to change their names to Bulgarian sounding names and where at one point uh, the language and music that were overtly Roma uh, as well as Turkish uh, were prohibited. Um, so uh, the end of communism uh, uh, should have been seen as, as a potentially positive development for Roma. Uh, and in certain respects, one, one could argue uh, that it was and that it was a positive development um, for the furtherance of human rights generally. Um, in the post-communist period in Europe, you have the spread of human, European human rights institutions. Essentially all of uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, with the exception of a couple of countries, are now parties to the major international human rights instruments. They are subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. And in fact, the, uh, and, and they're also parties to the European Social Charter, which is a, an instrument which enshrines in European law uh, almost all of the economic and social rights that were the hallmark uh, and the distinctive feature of, uh, of at least the ideology and the politics of, of communist regimes, even if they weren't always um, provided in practice, uh, through European social democracy, these, uh, these norms have now um, uh, become part of the, the legal landscape uh, uh, throughout Europe. Um, and there have been real advances uh, in um, the protection of civil and political rights, certainly, um, and, and economic and social rights throughout the region. Um, but there is a dark side to the collapse of communism for Roma uh, uh, that continues to play out um, in Europe today. 
uh, the economic uh, structure that provided employment for so many uh, uh, Roma people and, and non-Roma alike uh, collapsed after communism collapsed and uh, Roma being sort of on the bottom of the economic ladder to begin with uh, were some of the first people to fall off that ladder. Um, and of course, uh, uh, one of the features of the economic system was it wasn't just a job, it was uh, a social safety net that was provided along with that job. Frequently your housing came through your workplace, uh, your health care came through your workplace, your education. And so when the jobs disappeared, a lot of uh, uh, those basic um, um, uh, socioeconomic supports disappeared for Roma as well. Um, second feature of the, the post-communist era is that with this uh, flowering of civil and political rights, flowering of free expression, people um, were free to give vent to uh, uh, racial animosity and ethnic hatred. Um, and again, you see this as uh, not just directed at Roma, but uh, directed against Jews, directed against other ethnic minorities throughout the region. Um, and you know what what communism did was not create this multi-ethnic paradise, but it managed to keep a lid on some of the more overt expressions of of uh, racial tension and animosity. Um, and so, you know, where we stand today, in many in many respects, the situation for Roma in Europe is worse uh, than it was under communism. Um, and as uh, the context of this program is is the Holocaust. Um, I think it's fair to reflect on uh, the specter of the Holocaust in Europe uh, and its implications for Roma today. Um, because uh, while I don't think, I, I think it's, uh, it would be an exaggeration to say that uh, 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 there is a, a danger of a, of a second Holocaust or genocide against, uh, attempted genocide against Roma people. Um, there are some ominous signs that we should all pay attention to. Uh, there are extremist politicians uh, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe who have uh, adopted the rhetoric of race hatred as a, uh, a means to propel themselves into power and keep themselves in power. Um, you have a political party in the Czech Republic during the Euro Parliament elections, I think it was 2009, ran advertisements calling for a final solution to the gypsy problem. Um, you have uh, uh, extremist politicians in Hungary, Bulgaria, and elsewhere. Uh, Hungary, particularly noteworthy uh, political party that has basically built its political platform on the notion of gypsy criminality as being the most important serious problem facing the Hungarian nation and the Hungarian people as distinct from the non-Hungarian Roma people uh, today. Uh, and they presently have about 12% uh, in the Hungarian parliament, um, having uh, gotten about 17% of the vote in the last elections uh, last year. Um, and unfortunately, this uh, discourse is not limited to extremist politicians. Essentially, the mainstream political discourse in Europe today, both in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, is a discourse that is fundamentally racist. Uh, you have uh, leading political figures in Italy, in Bulgaria, in Romania, uh, in Hungary, in Slovakia, the list goes on and on, who have uh, openly expressed uh, the idea that gypsies are ethnically uh, uh, predisposed to crime um, and the there's absolutely no political consequence uh, to making these kinds of statements in fact the consequence I presume is favorable that's why they make them because they feel like it will gain some benefit um, um, politically and so apart from expressions of displeasure by European institutions uh, uh, there, there really has been no adverse consequence for this kind of, uh, of, of racist discourse. Um, uh, another um, feature of the, the post-communist era is that economic development uh, has not reached Roma people, by and large. 
uh, it's actually been harmful in the sense that uh, land in which Roma lived for many years and sometimes for generations, uh, under communism all the land was owned by the state and so uh, the, the Roma owned nothing but it wasn't such a big deal. Uh, with capitalism and privatization suddenly the land on which Roma lived becomes very valuable and places near city centers that uh, where Roma may have lived for 50 years or more um, are suddenly uh, prime targets for development. And so whereas under communism the state owned everything and Roma owned nothing, today under capitalism the Roma still own nothing. Uh, and they are subject to uh, pressure and to um, uh, forced eviction as a result um, in the name of development. The um, socioeconomic indicators for Roma today are appalling. Uh, I'll give you a few examples, but I would just predicate this list by um, noting that by and large uh, countries with significant Roma populations are not collecting uh, the fundamental information that they, uh, uh, that they should collect in order to understand uh, the socioeconomic status of Roma. Uh, they don't know how many Roma live within their borders. They're not uh, asking people to identify themselves by ethnicity in, in census, censuses, uh, although that hopefully will change in the next couple of years. Um, and they hide behind European data protection rules and say, well, we're not really allowed to collect information on the basis of ethnicity because that would violate EU uh, data protection principles, uh, which is not true, uh, but nonetheless it, it provides a useful fig leaf to uh, ignore the extent of the problem. But um, there is data that has been collected through various research means, and, and I'll just give you a few uh, examples. Uh, in the area of education, um, in the Czech Republic, approximately 34% of Romani children complete primary school. 5% uh, complete secondary school. In Serbia, the numbers are 23% and 5%. Uh, France, uh, numbers are a bit higher, 60%. Uh, well, 60% school attendance at the primary level. It's not clear how many actually complete school. Uh, and of course, in the education area, one of the uh, uh, big human rights problems is the segregation of Romani children into special education. Uh, and in a country like the Czech Republic, uh, something like 30% of Romani children are in special education. Um, in the area of um, employment, uh, in Ukraine, the estimate is that 90% of the Roma population has no regular form of employment, a similar number for Romania. Um, in Serbia, the unemployment rate for uh, working age Roma is estimated to be 51%. Uh, in France, 39%. Uh, um, and I could give you numbers for the, for the majority population, but you'll trust me that the, those numbers are much lower for the majority than for the Roma population in all of those countries. Um, the area of health care, you have uh, uh, TB, the prevalence of tuberculosis in Roma communities uh, in Serbia, for example, uh, can be as much as two and a half times the national average. Um, and we have somebody in the audience who I'm sure can tell us more about uh, the health care situation of Roma later on. Um, uh, in Macedonia, where um, the, uh, many Roma lack uh, basic identity documents, uh, it means that m many Roma are uninsured uh, and have no health insurance at all. So uh, the numbers range from 30% in some uh, settlements uh, to uh, up to 90% of Roma in some communities who have no health insurance. Um, the litany of rights violations is maybe familiar to you if you... Uh, study the subject at all if you read the papers, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about them briefly. Uh, in addition to this climate of uh, racist political discourse, um, you have uh, the problem of violence against Roma and uh, the failure of the state to respond adequately to that violence. So in Hungary, for example, since 2008, there have been nine murders of Roma, many more attacks. Uh, we counted uh, something like 49 um, violent attacks. In none of those cases of murder has there been a conviction 
of a guilty person of, 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 of a perpetrator. Um, uh, in the Czech Republic, you've had a little better uh, response, at least to very notorious cases of violence. Um, but too often throughout the region, violence uh, is met with impunity. And so, in, again, thinking about the, uh, the lessons of the Holocaust, if you will, uh, when you have racist political discourse, uh, which is accepted by mainstream society, and you have violence against Roma, which is met with impunity, um, that's a very dangerous combination. That's one that we should, we should be aware of. I've already mentioned the problem of uh, segregation in schools. Uh, Romani children uh, frequently are not in school at all. Uh, and when they are in school, they are frequently segregated either in special education, uh, not because they are, well, they may be considered in some sense to have a disability, but most of the time the disability is that they are Roma. Um, and uh, you have many children who are, are uh, segregated in, in schools uh, uh, in, in other forms. Um, over the summer, uh, many of you read about the uh, expulsions of Roma from France. Uh, free movement has become a particular concern of Western Europe as the European Union expands and uh, more people become EU citizens and are able to travel freely throughout Europe, uh, Roma are moving. Not because they're nomadic, but because they are looking for jobs and they are looking for a place where they can raise their children free of discrimination. Uh, and, and some examples of this is you have now the largest number, uh, well, for a while, uh, two years ago, the largest number of asylum seekers in Canada, which has a uh, traditionally uh, fairly progressive uh, asylum system, the largest number were Roma from the Czech Republic. Uh, Canada has now imposed visa restrictions on Czech nationals to try to deal with that problem, and now the largest number of asylum seekers to Canada are uh, Roma from Hungary. Uh, Roma are moving to France uh, and Italy, as we all know, uh, and the response of Western Europe has been to uh, deny their rights uh, as EU citizens to move freely to seek work uh, and residence in those countries. Um, and I just want to end with a sort of a, a recent example of a situation that um, illustrates the interconnectedness of um, Roma exclusion, how it can move from one country to the other. Of course, in France, the majority of Roma migrants uh, are from Romania, uh, and I think the same is true in Italy at this point, uh, in addition to a great number of, a m much larger number of, of Roma who are nationals, Italian nationals in Italy and French nationals in France, but the, the, the ones who are migrants are primarily from Romania. Um, and if anybody wonders why they move, well, here's an example of why they move. Uh, on December 17th in Cluj, a city of about 400,000 people in Romania, the police showed up on a street in the center of the city where that was populated largely by Roma. And they told the people that uh, they were being expelled uh, and that they had better apply for social housing because their own houses were going to be destroyed. Um, 270 people were uh, removed from this downtown area. Their homes were destroyed. The temperature outside was about minus 10 degrees Celsius. And they were asked, uh, some of them, the ones who had, could demonstrate that they had uh, uh, residents in Cluj were uh, asked to sign some documents saying that they agreed to be relocated. So they were relocated, those who, who could prove their residence in Cluj were relocated to a garbage dump 18 kilometers from the city center. Formerly they had lived, uh, you know, their, their homes were not luxurious by our standards, but they had uh, two bedroom flats with heat, hot water, electricity, all the basics. Uh, they were moved to this place uh, 
in near the garbage dump. There was also a toxic waste dump there from a pharmaceutical factory that's since closed. And they were put in containers with no heat. Uh, oh, they were given some firewood, but they had to bring uh, wood-burning stoves along themselves. No hot water, and they share now seven to 13 people in a room uh, sharing a bathroom with three other flats. And if you think back to the rhetoric of President Sarkozy and, and, and Berlusconi uh, about the Roma migrants who were uh, engaged in begging and trafficking and, and, and other criminal activity, uh, let's take a look at these Roma in Cluj who were uh, bulldozed out of their homes. These were working families. These were people who had jobs with children in school. Now they live 18 kilometers away from their home. It takes them about an hour and a half uh, to get to their jobs. Uh, the children for now are being bused to their school, but there's talk of building a new segregated school closer to the garbage dump where they live, which of course will be a great benefit to them. And so if you want to know why it is that Roma from Romania are going to France and going to Italy, just ask the authorities in Cluj. They're setting up a situation in, uh, in their own countries that makes it impossible for Roma to live uh, and forcing them to go elsewhere. Um, and I hope that uh, as we reflect upon the, the legacy of the Holocaust that this process of exclusion and dehumanization will give us all pause. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Krista and Rob. I'm sure that you have questions for our speakers. There is a microphone. Okay, great. Yes, the second speaker happened to mention that uh, the uh, Roma are now citizens of the European Union. And of course, uh, it's inter I would like to ask, how does that, uh, how has that changed the condition of the Roma in these one separate nationalities that now become uh, part of the European Union? Uh, what kind of representation do they have? And what kind of international cooperation among the Roma themselves, such as, for instance, the Roma of Spain or France with the Roma of, of Romania or, or Czechoslovakia? Um, how, does, how has that changed their condition? And what possibilities does that offer in the future to improve their overall picture within Europe? Especially as it seems to be, if I'm not mistaken, that, this, that their nationality as European citizens is somehow under the heading of a extraterritorial people? Um, well, first of all, the, um, uh, the significant, not all Roma are, are European citizens, but those who are in countries that have become member states of the EU are, uh, and that includes Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia. Um, and what, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the human rights regime throughout Europe is, is broadly applicable to non-EU member states as well as EU member states. The distinctive feature of the EU is freedom of movement and the ability of any person who is a citizen of a state that is a member of the European Union to travel anywhere else within the European Union without a passport um, de facto, without travel documents at all, if you go by if you go by land, um, uh, and uh, uh, reside and seek work. Now there are restrictions on um, this right, uh, and in fact, some countries have specifically imposed restrictions on uh, nationals from Romania and Bulgaria, and the EU has allowed this as a kind of transitional measure. You may remember. Uh, Back in, I think, 2004, there was this uh, sort of popular, the popular boogeyman at the time in France was the Polish plumber. Uh, there was this fear in France and in other countries of Western Europe that as Europe enlarged uh, and that uh, Eastern European 
laborers would come and take away Western European jobs. Um, now I think the, the Polish plumber has been replaced by the, you know, the Roma beggar as the sort of uh, phantasm of, of, and f fear of, of uh, Western European imagination. Um, so the free movement uh, right is, is the distinctive new right that is afforded to uh, any national of an EU member state. Um, and what it means is, a, uh, you know, politically, uh, well, Roma are not very well represented politically, either domestically or at the European level. You have today uh, one Romani, or at least one self-identified Romani member of the European Parliament from Hungary. Uh, you used to have two from Hungary, but uh, but now you just have one. Um, and while there has been some, I, I think the the, the uh, and, and the issue of Roma exclusion has become a, a major issue of concern at the European level, and it's, it's a popular issue in European Union discourse, but um, unfortunately it's a lot of discourse without a lot of action uh, up till now. Um, where you have seen some development, you, you know, you, you, you mentioned the question of uh, connections between Roma populations in different countries. As you note, um, Roma, you know, in Spain uh, don't necessarily um, have a lot of, in common with Roma in the Czech Republic. Um, uh, they f most likely speak different languages. Um, but you do have, I think, a growing level, uh, a layer of civil society and Roma uh, intellectuals who are trying to create those links. Um, some of them are positing the idea of more of a Roma nation state. Um, I, uh, it's not an idea that has a lot of traction. Uh, but um, on a more practical level, there are many organizations and activists who are creating links um, between themselves uh, uh, in different countries. But um, it hasn't translated into any significant political movement yet. Um, well, I don't know much about the subject, but I would say, I mean, if you look at Italy, for example, there's certainly some parallels, um, uh, and the um, uh, and in France as well. And to some extent, you know, the the discourse in France uh, was anti-immigrant one moment and anti-Roma the next moment, uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, the, and, and similarly in Italy, the unease is this notion of people coming from the outside uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 polluting the nation state. Now, it, it sort of ignores the fact that in both countries, for example, uh, the large number of Roma are um, citizens of France and Italy, respectively, and that the proportion of, of migrant Roma is quite small. So in France you have 500,000 uh, French nationals uh, who are Roma, or Jeanne de Voyage as the French call them, uh, the French state calls them. Um, and uh, you know in Italy uh, uh, and, and you have maybe 15,000 migrants uh, who are Roma uh, and in Italy the numbers are something like 150,000 uh, of which 40-50% are Italian nationals. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there is some connection. Clearly, Sarkozy uh, and the Interior Minister of France both kind of were switching interchangeably between talking about the immigrant threat and the, and the Roma threat. Professor Ergas? I wonder if, you, if I could ask you to reflect for a second on the question of the relationship between the uh, emphasis and the, stigma, the increasing stigmatization and uh, discrimination against the Roma population and issues that relate directly to 
uncertainty, not just economic uncertainty, but uncertainties that have to do with national identity in the context of the formation of the, and consolidation of the European Union and the creation of a European political space. So that's one aspect of my question. And obviously what I'm wondering to myself is about the mobilization of tropes that have to do with immigration and with otherness in order to try to consolidate a national subject or, or a dominant subject. The second part of my question has to do actually with the interplay between the national and the European in terms of institutional politics and the, and the defense of the human rights of Roma people and more generally of immigrant and of other. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm actually sorry that I, I'm uh, confusing Roma populations and the discourse on immigration. I think that that happens often, but clearly the dynamics are very different. Roma as are not only not no, nomadic, they're often also not immigrants. And I think it's important in terms especially of the discourse about the inside and the outside to remember that they're an insider that can be used in outsider function. Um, but so then my second question is really what has European jurisprudence and law had to say in terms of actually uh, limiting national, nationalist impulses and discriminatory impulses and do you think that I teach human rights law, so maybe I have, I have a stake in the answer to this, but do you think that actually uh, mobilizing the instruments of law is useful, is likely to be the right way for, what is it getting, is really the question here. I'm, I'm not sure I can speak to the second question um, so much, although I'll think about it. The, the first question I would say, First of all, by way of background, that I, I actually do my field work in the Czech Republic. Um, and it's an, there's an interesting dynamic that goes on with Roma and the way that they're held up as a spectacle in the public sphere that teaches Czechs, implicitly understood as white Czechs, um, what it is to be European uh, by showing a kind of pathology that is the, the Romani private sphere. Um, and so in the process through which, for example, Roma have been ghettoized and in the past t 10 years, maybe the past 15 years, uh, something like 330 ghettos have sprung up in the Czech Republic um, and a good percentage of the Romani population now live in these ghettos. Um, and people are pushed into them generally on the municipal level. Uh, there's a whole series of sort of quasi-legal ways that this happens, but people are often um, evicted from their housing for small fines, for example, on their water bill uh, that are then compounded to their rent and then turned into the reason for eviction. And you, you'll see in the paper, for example, stories where uh, Romani families have been evicted, they're sitting on the street, their furniture is there, everybody's sitting outside, there are a bunch of kids, and then of course the social worker comes and takes the children, and then of course the journalist says, but don't they know you can't have eight children in Europe anymore? Um, and, and so there's a lot of ways in which the, the basis of the prejudice is staged. Um, I, I think that's partially what's going on in Kluge, for example, uh, the prejudice against Roma as unhygienic, for example, rests on people not having access to uh, hygienic conditions. Um, but, but also the, the notion of what is a, an appropriate private sphere that then stages what is an appropriate way of being a public check in the public sphere that is the basis of this new liberalism that is supposed to reconsolidate. I think this is taught to checks by staging Roma partly as a kind of pathological private sphere that is available in the public sphere. Um, and, th and that teaches them how, in turn, to be European in, in this sort of European liberal order. If that gets to the question. Okay. I won't say much more on, on the first topic, except that clearly nationalism uh, in many countries as a um, political tool is very much married to an anti-European sentiment. Um, the two frequently go hand in hand. Interestingly, what, what is not so clear is the connection between economic dislocation and economic bad times and anti-Roma racism because in many cases uh, the anti-Roma racism predated at least the most recent economic collapse uh, and you can find examples of the rise of 
extreme right parties at a time when the economic situation in Bulgaria, for example, or Czech Republic was actually pretty good. Um, so that link is, is a little complex. As far as your second question about, uh, which is really the, the one that cuts me to the core, because the question is, does the law matter? <laughs> um, and, and, and part of what your intimation might be is that for some, uh, this whole institution of, of, of human rights norms is seen as a European bureaucratic construct, you know? The, the, the action takes place in, an, in a supranational court in Strasbourg, France, uh, and then imposes decisions back on um, the member, well, in this case, the member states of the Council of Europe. Um, but more significantly, the question is, what, what good is it done? Uh, and as lawyers, we have to, I think, be candid in saying that it hasn't done a lot of good. Uh, we have some very nice jurisprudence which has been developed uh, through litigation which starts at the domestic level in a particular country and wends its way through the domestic system and then when you've exhausted all your remedies domestically you can bring uh, an appeal before the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights has developed some good basic jurisprudence for example in the issue of violence uh, where it's uh, affirmed in the cases of violence against Roma, the obligation of the state to undertake a thorough investigation and prosecute offenders, whether those are offenders that are state actors, in the case of police abuse, for example, or private uh, actor violence. Um, in the area of school segregation, uh, you have three decisions of the European Court of Human Rights that have uh, found states to be in violation of the European Convention because they have illegally segregated Romani children in schools. Uh, in the Czech Republic, in Greece, and in um, Croatia. Unfortunately, in each of these countries, the level of segregation is just as high today. And in fact, in one country, most cases, it takes so long to get to the European Court of Human Rights that if you're talking about a school segregation case and a child, by the time you get the case to the European Court, the kid's already done with whatever substandard school uh, uh, education they've had, uh, and, and the decision is largely symbolic. But in the case of Greece, actually the, uh, the case did get to court in time. The court found that the uh, Greek government was illegally segregating these kids, and these kids are still in school today, segregated. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, to some extent, violating the European Convention of Human Rights and being found in violation and being assessed a nominal financial penalty, which the states invariably pay, has become a cost of doing business. It's a cost of violating rights. Well, okay, we'll pay 4,000 euro for every uh, student in the Czech Republic who was shunted aside to uh, special education, uh, and, and the system remains in place. So uh, it's a discouraging climate, I would say, for a lawyer, but at the same time, I have to think that there is a um, there is value in creating the norm, uh, the European norm, which does trickle down to some extent. The Czech government did respond to the European court decision in some small ways, first of all by seeking itself to ascertain just how many Romani children were in special education in the Czech Republic. They now do their own surveys and they know the answer. Uh, they have at least taken some small steps to ensure that Roma are not, quote, wrongly placed in the system, which begs the question whether the system should exist for anyone, even a child with a genuine learning need. I would submit that there is no place for that kind of segregated schooling, even for children with uh, uh, with learning needs, um, and uh, and so there's and there's a dialogue that goes on at the international level and more importantly at the domestic level, uh, and there's a similar dialogue going on in Croatia. Uh, I'm less optimistic about what's happening in Greece, um, so we're taking baby steps through the legal system. Can I actually can I add? Of course. I just add. So I've been thinking about your question standing over there, um, because the question of what the law matters is something that's puzzled me recently in, in the Czech Republic, and again from an ethnographic perspective. 
um, well, actually, let me back up and say that uh, you know, there have been recent court decisions that have outlawed the far right-wing party for undermining the foundations of the democratic state, which was clearly an anti-Gypsy party. It's reformed, uh, but it's lost a lot of its momentum. There is a, a case where several neo-Nazi right-wing uh, party members of this party or affiliates of this party had firebombed a Romani house um, in which a two-year-old was severely burned and this became a very big scandalous case and they were given quite stringent sentences um, recently in the courts and this is perhaps a good thing um, but the thing that I wonder about is who it is that the law is being used for uh, and who has access to it so I also think about a case uh, for example friends of mine who are Romani um, who were in an apartment that they had paid their rent on uh, and the landlady decided, this was years ago, the landlady decided that she wanted them out. They were gypsies. She didn't want gypsies living in her newly privatized building. Uh, and so she came and tried to evict them with dogs and the police said, you know, no, this is not acceptable. This kind of violence is not acceptable. Uh, so then she came back uh, and she turned off their electricity. Uh, she took the front door off of their house. She put bars on the window. Um, and she basically made it impossible for them to live there and they took her to court and it turns out that the landlady was friends with the mayor and the mayor was friends with the judge and they were in court for a very long time with all kinds of postponements and prolongings and 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 they, they it took them years to have any kind of access to the rule of law uh, to apply to this case um, so you know I think I, I don't know what the law matters but I think it does matter who has access to it in which circumstances and if it's, it's one thing if the Czech state says, well, we're going to discipline these Czechs who behave violently in the public sphere, and this is clearly not appropriate. But it is another question about whether Roma actually have access to all of the protections of being uh, in that juridical order that, um, that, that, Czechs are, that space that Czechs are already in, white Czechs are already in. If I could, I just want to make one more point. I mean, I, th I think there's value in legal norm setting to um, provide a framework of expectations for society. Now sometimes the law is, uh, or infrequently, is the law is far ahead of society and that was certainly the case I think in the United States um, when Brown versus Board of Education was decided uh, prohibiting uh, separate but equal schools in the US. Um, but you know it created um, uh, a legal framework that was then uh, enforced in some cases, not in others, by the coercive might of the state, including federal troops, which is not what you have, unfortunately, happening in, in the Czech, Czech Republic and other countries. You have the, the sort of legal veneer without the enforcement. Um, but hopefully what that does is, at some point, the legal veneer creates a situation where, at least in polite company, you accept uh, certain norms of, of anti-discrimination and equality even if you don't feel it in your belly and then over time society will develop so that more and more people actually feel in their belly that this is the way things should be and that segregation is wrong. Uh, unfortunately in Europe we're not at the level yet even where in polite company uh, racist discourse is, is disfavored as we see uh, from the statements of mainstream politicians. Second and third row. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment and a question which uh, is about the comparison between Western and Eastern Europe and um, anti discrimination strategies and why they work better or they don't work in one place and in the other. Um, when Robert was first mentioning the situation in Cluj, I was thinking that. I'm Italian and work on Roma rights in Italy. I was thinking that you could change the name of the city to Milan and Rome and the description of the situation wouldn't be that different because you have municipal regulations in both cities which establish that Roma can be moved to authorized camps, camps which are surveilled by private police, uh, to live in which you need not to have any criminal record, so special conditions to live there, where you need to show identity papers to get in and you cannot circulate after 10 p.m. So the situation is not that different and there aren't so many motives why Roma should be willing to leave Romania to face similar situation in, in, Western, in Western Europe such as in Italy. This is not that recent because although we have 
special legislation in Italy since 2008, the situation of Roma camps has been the same for the last 15 to 20 years. Now, what I am a little bit, uh, what I was thinking about is whether there isn't a higher level of impunity of Western European countries in comparison to Eastern European countries recently as regards these matters, and whether this has anything to do with the Holocaust. Concrete example, when last summer Sarkozy was expelling Romanian Roma from France, uh, Vivian Reding, the Commissioner for Justice of the European Union, told that this was unacceptable and that this reminded her of events occurring during the Second World War. There was a very strong response from France. We are not racist. We don't know what race is. We have experienced the Holocaust. We had a collaborationist government then, but in, we know how to manage these things. We are not racist. The same thing could more or less be said from Italy when the European Union intervened in the process of the census. The answer was no, we are not collecting ethnicity, we are not doing ethnic measures, we know what racism is. And if you look at European Union conditionality towards Eastern Europe in order to allow countries to get in, they have asked them to implement measures on ethnic equality. If you look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, they have punished some of the Eastern European countries which were implementing measures discriminating the Roma. There is nothing yet on Western Europe. And I have the impression that there is this level of impunity which is really high because the Western European member state do not collect racial data because they cannot, because we do not know what race is, because we have experienced it the Holocaust, we have been strongly implicated with that, and we know that race is not a concept which should be used in either way. And so we cannot be charged for that. Don't you think, I mean, do you, would you agree with this? Um, well, I think there's a certain, certainly, um, to some extent, Eastern Europe as the newcomers to the club uh, as you noted, were subjected to a little bit more scrutiny. And the pre-accession agreements for European Union entry did speak in vague terms of human rights, and there was certainly a lot of civil society activism, even though there wasn't much real action at the political level within the EU, but there was certainly a lot of civil society action around getting uh, the newcomers to the European Union to abide by human rights norms and so in that sense there's always been a greater focus uh, on uh, the Eastern European uh, uh, member states to the European Union in a sense that you know old Europe uh, had its house in order uh, and therefore wasn't as, as, as uh, big a concern and when you look at Roma rights in particular what you find is that with the exception of Spain uh, civil society uh, groups that are focused on Roma rights issues are just much less developed in Western Europe. I mean, I think we have a much harder time identifying people, partners in Italy, for example, uh, with whom to work uh, than in Romania. Um, and in Portugal, it's the, the same issue. Um, France is, uh, is a little bit better. Um, but I think there's sort of less of a tradition of, um, of rights defense in these communities, why that is, is that because, you know, part, part of it is undoubtedly because uh, until recently at least there's, um, at least conditions in France, for example, or the UK are relatively better, so, uh, but um, uh, whether it feeds into this perception that Western Europe is somehow uh, um, Privileged because uh, uh, because of their experience uh, from World War II, and they and and and, and, and they won't make those mistakes again. It's it's hard to say. I'm take it. Uh, I'm, I would say uh, just to add to what Rob said. Um, 
that there is an expectation more generally that Eastern European countries in the wake of the fall of communism had not come to grips with their past, which is something that Western Europe had done, and that expectation that they would be going through that process of Vergangenheit's uh, the, going the mastery of the past or the, the coming to grips with that thing that had happened in the fascist period, in the Nazi period, um, should inflect uh, state policy and uh, that ran up against um, obviously a, a tremendous amount of discrimination and persecution of Roma. Whether, that get, whether the Eastern or whether Western Europe used that as a kind of pass or whether the expectation that they had already done this uh, gives them, gave them a, a space to criticize that, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's a, a good question. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's interesting that the previous question was about the higher degree of impunity. I would like to go back to, to the issue of memory and ask a twofold question. Uh, first of all, I, I'm under the impression I'm myself the child of an Auschwitz survivor and I grew up with the stories of the Egyptians and, uh, in Auschwitz and in Fossoli before they were deported from Italy. I am under the impression that 99% of the Italians don't even know that Roma and Sinti were deported. And I wonder, this issue of memory and the lack of memory, and I'm very hesitant to use the, the word the lack of memory, could have and does affect the image, the public image that Roma have. And question number two, is there a debate, internal debate? Because, I mean, it's... I, 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 I've hardly seen any, any Roma survivor. I know there are some. I remember recently an Italian paper had a story of one of the oldest uh, Roma survivor on Italy, something like, like that, that passed away. But I wonder, is there a debate? And if you have, because you mentioned in the presentation, you were talking about the, the will to forget the debate, or the, the will to forget, or the, of the hesitance towards ethnography. But is there a... a, a a discussion among, the intelle among Roma intellectuals about all this? And has anybody done any work on the effect of this lack of memory? I, I don't do my field work with Romani intellectuals or activists, so there is a debate. Um, there are all kinds of discussions that go on on that level about uh, whether there should be, for example, a separate term to refer to what happened to Roma in the Holocaust, Puraimos, that would allow for a greater recognition of the particularities of their persecution. Um, what I can say is that the Roma survivors, the Romani survivors that I worked with, and I did most of my field work uh, in Romani communities uh, where people were making claims for Holocaust reparations, found it very difficult to recognize themselves in the standard narrative of the Holocaust that was put to them for reparations claims. When they were asked to tell what had happened to them, first of all, the Holocaust wasn't a word that they used. Uh, Poraimos wasn't a word that they used. Um, they had an experience that didn't fit. Uh, and they also had no real option about whether or not to claim, uh, to make claims for reparations because people live in such states of dire poverty that the question of whether or not you choose to remember or get to remember or how you remember is superseded um, in uh, phenomena or, or events, phenomena like reparations claims. Um, so that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I, I think that in my experience I've seen Roma um, put on stages and, and asked to display trauma that their trauma of this period in ways that they don't in fully respond to. Uh, so a few years ago I was at a, a um, panel discussion at the Jewish community in Prague about the Romani Holocaust and there was a survivor, an Auschwitz survivor, who was also a survivor of the Leti camp, which uh, had been started originally in the Czech Second Republic, uh, became a Nazi gypsy camp uh, from which most people were deported to Auschwitz. Um, and there had been a story going around that gained a kind of currency um, that the, the Czech guards at Leti were meaner to the Romani in, uh, internees at Leti than the German guards were at Auschwitz. Uh, and there was a big debate about the Czech complicity in the Holocaust or collaboration. And one of the stories was, well, the Czech guards wouldn't sell Roma uh, cigarettes, whereas in Auschwitz you could get cigarettes from the German guards. And this guy was up on stage and he was asked this story, um, he was asked about this, 
and, and it was clear that the person wanted him to say, yeah, it was terrible. Uh, the checks really traumatized us, and I will never forget this. And he said, well, you know, I, I, I don't smoke. Right? <laughs> I should try it again, and she said, well, you know, maybe, maybe you heard, and he said, you should really ask somebody who smokes, right? He, he wouldn't perform it for her, and she tried. She tried really hard, and, and, and uh, Roma don't necessarily perform the things that we want from them that in this kind of, and when we think about this discussion about wound culture in the past, you know, 20 years maybe, that there's been a kind of transformation um, in the structure of grievance in modern democracies that now rests on a kind of competitive display of, of wounds and trauma, particularly in relationship to the Holocaust. Uh, I think Roma get alighted from that. Um, I think they don't display in the way that we want. Uh, and that means that what happened to them actually sort of is eclipsed. Um, and do you have something you want to say specifically? Please. To speak as a Romani activist who is actually descended from Holocaust victims and Holocaust survivors, and I think that that's a really awesome story. First of all, where did they find a Romani man who doesn't smoke? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I've never met one. <laughs> I, 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 um, I, think, I think so much of this is really true. You know, so much of this I find in my own family. But I think the one thing that I really want to add to that is that I think there are Roma out there who are willing to perform, who have in, you know, sort of been able to internalize, because they're sort of more literate, more educated, whatever, who have internalized the, the larger Holocaust rhetoric and the larger Holocaust discourse. And I think a really fundamental problem, which I feel like we've sort of skirted over today, is the fact that um, much of the time they're not allowed the space or the time to speak. So we're talking about the UN, commemorations. One was just rescheduled um, for the 10th, so you can go see for yourself what happens there. We're talking about the United States Holocaust, which it has nothing to do, <laughs> as I've learned, with, um, with Krista. But, um, you know, th there are Roma available who will speak and who will sing and who will give testimony, and there has been a very, very long and nasty history of these Roma being silenced. Um, so that is all I wanted to add. Thank you. My name is Petra Galbart. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question over there. And then here, and then another one, and then... Thank you very much for your presentation. Very educational. Um, I have two comments to make, two maybe questions. Um, when you were giving your presentation, I was listening to it in fascination. And as you said, garbage dumps, eviction, getting out, police. I was not in my head going, yeah, mm -hmm, terrible, terrible, awful. But then that changed to yes, yes, yes. This country, this country, this country has it too. So isn't this a more worldly predicament rather than a Roma predicament? Is it not a contagion that's spreading and infecting all over the world? Do we not find this all over the world? What makes it unique with the Roma culture and people? And you also mentioned um, racial hatred discourse. I would like to know that's very much big in literature. I would like to know how is it different than what we have had in the past 10 years in America? Is it the same? Is it different? If it's different, how is it different? I'll try the first one anyway. Um, I mean, the, the and others have mentioned the the overlaps between um, both popular discontent with immigration and official policy toward immigration and the and. and popular discontent and official policy toward Roma uh, in Europe. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, there are certain differences uh, because Roma, uh, first of all, uh, many, while, while there are some rights violations particular to Roma migrants, um, there, most of the violations are, are pretty homegrown uh, and are inflicted by the state on their own nationals. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, fr from a rights perspective, sometimes that matters and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there are some human rights norms which would be applicable to anyone within 
uh, a country's borders, such as uh, the right to life and to be free from violence. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, and then there are others, such as uh, uh, the right, sort of some of the economic and social rights, right to work and um, education, some other things which states are able to limit to, um, to their own nationals. So I think there is a distinction. There's sort of a, there's sort of a distinction in, in your gut. Maybe it's not um, politically correct to say so, but uh, the idea that um, Italy, for example, can treat uh, Italian nationals uh, uh, in this way, putting them in camps, conducting, you mentioned the evictions in Milan, something like 5,800 people uh, in the last year were the subject of evictions uh, in Milan alone, 5,800 Roma. Some of them were non-Italians, but some of them were Italian nationals. Um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, I think there is a certain resonance with that when, when you're, say, you're doing this to your own citizens, uh, that feels a little different, even though from a legal perspective it may not always be different. Uh, on the first question, um, is this so different than any place else in the world? Well, uh, maybe not. A gypsy, I think, is a category of objection uh, uh, that Roma are forced to inhabit. Um, there are categories of objection everywhere, people living on trash dumps in a lot of places. Um, there's a certain set of particularities to the European case, but surely you could draw comparisons that were much wider. The racial discourse, the racist rhetoric in the Czech Republic, um, it is very interesting, actually. Uh, there's a lot of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It's not their race, it's their culture, which is inbred, of course, racialized notions of culture that allow people to say things that might otherwise sound really, truly just unrepentantly fascist. Um, just one example of, of how things work when people think no one's really listening. Uh, in the city of Ostrava, there was a, a mayor named Liana Janachkova who, um, was a mayor of one of the, the parts of the city, uh, which is split into sort of 23 districts. And uh, she was really known for having a very anti-Gypsy policy, for uh, getting a lot of votes in the non-Romani community on these grounds. And she was recorded a few years ago at a municipal meeting about housing. And she uh, has a, uh, two main ghettos in her district. And people sort of, Roma sort of move between them. It's really very difficult to actually find housing that's not in one of these ghettos. And she was recorded secretly at this meeting saying, well, uh, you know, if it were up to me, I'd move them all into a space behind barbed wire and I'd throw some dynamite over, ha, 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 right? Uh, and uh, then one of her deputies said something along the lines of, yeah, you know, I'd love to shoot him, but nobody will give me the order. Again, joking, but not. And then this was um, released in the public sphere. Uh, and there was, of course, a big hue and cry. This is hate speech. And uh, she had, by that time, been elected to the Senate and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm protected. It's political speech. And this went back and forth for a long time. Um, and she was protected because there is an exemption. Um, but whether it's hate speech or political speech or whether political speech, whether political speech has become infused with hate speech, I think is a big question. Uh, in the Czech Republic. Um, and recently in her senatorial campaign, uh, I mentioned the case of the, uh, the firebombing of a Romani house in which a two-year-old was, um, was burned very severely and which has become a very big national scandal. She uh, had big billboards uh, with pictures saying, vote for Liana Janachkova, and I'm going to keep on saying uh, what I think should be said. And then on the side, um, there was a matchbox with, with that same um, same phrase. It's a clear reference to the spate of arson attacks that have occurred, that have been occurring for the past 10 years, that have intensified or even worse in Hungary. Uh, and yet, how do you call her on that? I mean, there's no explicit racial mention in that piece, and yet it's, it's clearly meant to spark uh, racist rhetoric. It's, me it's meant to, to continue this spate of attacks on Roma. Uh, and that's part of how hate speech works in that area. Uh, whether that's comparable to here, I think, is maybe a question for the audience, for you. 
First, I'd like to thank you for today. I, I'm from the University of Delaware. I've been in studies in Romania for the last 10 years, basically on the peasant women and Roma women of Transylvania and the impact of EU accession within the context of Romanian society. And I want to make a couple of points. I think we have to be very careful when we blur the distinctions between racism, sexism, and classism, because some of these effects, some of the comments made today, could actually be categorized in those elements too. Specifically, when we talk about uh, the relation with Romania and France, uh, you clarified the point, but the, the truth is, in the, as part of the 2007 accession for Bulgaria and Romania, all Romanians were prohibited from seeking jobs in France, the UK, and Britain. So some of the most advanced industrial societies put a kibosh, to, basically driven by their unions. They didn't want competition. So that was not racism. That was a general blanket across the board prohibition. Currently today, Romania has approximately a million workers in Italy and Spain who are being impacted by the, the Greek and Spanish crisis. The, they're about 38% unemployed. But that was a very important amount of Romanians. And even in Europe, sometimes people confuse Romanian with Roma. And we have to be very careful when we talk about these things. Someone raised the issue of memory. There's some wonderful studies being done at Central European University in Budapest. There's a, a gender studies magazine that comes out four times a year called Asphasia, A-S-P-A-S-I-A. And they, they've done a wonderful uh, series of research on the memory of the, the pre-1989 re revolution, the, the transition from communism to post-communism in Central Europe. And it's a wonderful uh, read to understand what, what is the memory process or lack of process. Why do women do it? Why do uh, poor people, why do, why do peasants do it? And why do Ro the Roma do it? Number two, um, and as far as Kluge is concerned, again, this is a, a very sensitive issue because many, many directives are coming from the European Union, forcing, for example, in the case of Romania, not only to change their constitution, to address uh, corruption, but also in city planning because during the communist era, Ceausescu, and then followed by Bicescu, the current thing, had an internal migration. Bringing, they, they felt that the progress of Romania was dependent upon moving people from the rural areas into the urban areas. And this mass migration, internal migration, caused some very serious social problems in the major urban areas. Uh, the ability to, to, to house, to provide health care, education, so forth. And in Cluj, where we, our University of Delaware, we, have a, we teach over there at, at the Public Policy Institute, we found that many of the areas in town, the urban areas, according to European directives, are being forced to, to upgrade the facilities. And so so the response is, it's not necessarily just racism per se, which racism is an integral element of it. It's also a response to European Union directives to, to be make sure that the accession goes smoothly. So I think we have to be very careful to look at some of the nuances of this, although I would certainly agree with you that racism is probably the leading ism there, but there's a lot of classism and sexism involved too. And the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, the question I would actually have then is, Many of the gender studies professors and, and the Roma advocates are turning, to, unfortunately, are turning to the European Union, finding that to bypass the Romanian parliament, for example, that there is, that's their best hope is to, to accelerate. You seem to be less optimistic about that. What do you see then as the, as the natural uh, options for women, uh, poor people, and Roma if they don't uh, depend upon the European Union and the core of human rights? What, what is their option or options? <laughs> Um, just one comment, I and mean, you're right uh, as far as the uh, uh, restriction on uh, employment. Uh, it was a restriction, first of all, that was allowed by EU law and was practiced by several countries and was imposed on nationals of Bulgaria and, and Romania, not specifically on Roma. However, if you look at President Sarkozy's uh, circular this summer and subsequently a Ministry of Interior document, that was um, uh, leaked to the press, uh, the expulsions were targeting Roma specifically, um, although uh, the, the French took pains to deny it, but the words were there, uh, undeniable. Um, the question of whether, where, where else to look if not the EU, I mean, I think you have to keep looking to European institutions to some extent, but we can see, I can see through, through my work at the Roma Rights Center, the limitations of those institutions. And in order to translate a European court decision on school segregation into some meaningful change, it's going to require a lot of work on the ground, uh, whether that's in the Czech Republic or Romania or anywhere else. And it requires a lot of persistent domestic level advocacy by domestic organizations, coupled with the pressure that we can sometimes bring to bear from the outside and, and from Europe. Very, very proud of the organization, but what are you doing? What, what, I mean, what's your mandate for the next year? 
Well, I mean, if you, you know, looking specifically at, at, at the issue of school segregation, we are both looking at new litigation. Uh, we, we bring the Czech, Croatia, and Greece cases to the U Council of Europe Committee of Ministers twice a year when they uh, look at how those judgments are being implemented or not implemented. And on the ground, we work with domestic level NGOs that are trying to press for uh, law reform and for policy reform in country. Uh, and in the Czech Republic for a couple of years it looked like that was making some modest progress, but with the new government I'd say that progress has been halted. Just one last brief question. And yes, then. I was just curious during World War II, were many Roma involved in resistance movements? Oh. I was just curious to know, during World War II, were many Roma involved in different resistance movements? Uh, Do you know? Yes, there are cases of, of Romani partisan units in Slovakia, Roma were partisans in Bulgaria. Um, some Roma escaped the internment camps in Sardinia and joined the Italian resistance. Um, I'm sure it's a phenomenon. Anywhere there's a resistance movement in occupied Eastern Europe. Uh, or in Axis states, um, I would imagine that there was Romani participation. Uh, I would say that I, I recently had a discussion, well, a few years ago I had a discussion with uh, somebody who did archival collections in Eastern Europe who goes to Eastern Europe uh, to look for collections related to the Holocaust um, and, and bring them back to the United States. And I asked if he was looking for this kind of documentation and he said, well, why would there be Roma in partisan units? Uh, because there's a kind of expectation in Roma, they don't have history, they don't have politics. Um, and so I think we would find a lot, actually, if we, if we made the assumption, the very basic assumption that you know, Roma have a history and have a politics and that politics impelled them to act in this period. So. And had normal jobs. And, and had normal jobs, and normal, yes. <laughs> Often, yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for your interest in our programs and in our annual symposium. And now, before having a drink of wine on the first floor, please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers, Krista Hegberg and Rob Kushan. Thank you.